Good morning. It's been a long time since I've been in a room with so many people to be so quiet. I'm Kerry Benninghoff. I live up in the State College area. I chair the House Policy Committee. We're honored that you take your time to be with us here this morning. We want to uh, take a moment to thank Jonathan Fritz and Representative Mike Pfeiffer for hosting us here today. Uh, we are also joined by Senator Lisa Baker, and I think maybe Senator Yall might be joining us as well. Uh, there are times where our two chambers do work together. Yesterday we had a hearing up in the uh, Mon Monroe area and actually had Republicans and Democrats working together on a hearing issue as well. So despite what you might hear in the news, we try to work together. Uh, we've come here collectively to see what we can do to improve job climates and job growth here in Pennsylvania. Our policy committee has been throughout Pennsylvania on three other types of hearings to try to hear from constituents, hear from business leaders, economic developers of what Pennsylvania is doing well, what we could be doing better and make us more competitive, make our state strong. You know, we're the Keystone State for a reason when we want to get it back to that. And sometimes our own regulations or regulations by the federal government upon us can have a uh, detrimental effect to that. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to our host, Representative Pfeiffer, pardon me, Representative John Fritz. And I want to thank you as constituents for sending both he and Michael down to Chair in the legislature, they're great, strong voices, and we're honored to have them. Chairman Benninghoff, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it is a wonderful sight to look out here and see all of you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. It is in the spirit of sincere gratitude that I acknowledge Barb Cordeling and Camp Lador for being the most gracious and accommodating hosts. We have a strong coalition. This is wonderful as I look to my left and I look to my right. We have a strong coalition of colleagues present. So colleagues, thank you. Senator Baker, thank you very, very much. And, uh, and to you folks, the constituents and taxpayers that took time out of your day to join us, you are, a, again, a wonderful sight, and I truly appreciate your being here. Chairman Benninghoff, you and your staff are top flight, and this event came together in the smoothest manner for that. Thank you. We're here today to discuss the DRBC's proposed permanent ban on natural gas drilling in the Delaware River Basin. And it is noteworthy, folks, it is noteworthy that there are a few testifiers absent, namely the governor's office, DEP, and DRBC. Those three individuals and agencies were invited to be here, and they declined. I look forward to testimony in the aim of creating awareness and dispelling any myths and untruths. And for the sake of, of background, I'll speak to the Delaware River Basin, which is 14,000 square miles. There are other basins within the Commonwealth. We have the Great Lakes Basin, we have the Potomac River Basin, we have the Susquehanna River Basin, and as well the Ohio River Basin. Across the Commonwealth, folks, landowners are prospering from the natural gas industry, farms are being saved and reinvigorated, and small towns are back to work. PA has the most rigorous oil and gas laws in the nation and I believe that we can protect our environment and develop this resource responsibly. Our landowners in the Northeast deserve the same opportunity. So again, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I hope everyone finds the testimony to be fulfilling and create awareness. Thank you. Chairman Benninghoff. Uh, good morning. It's great to see everyone here. I just want to thank uh, Chairman Benninghoff for being here and, and a number of our colleagues that. Uh, um, made the trip here today. Um, they give us a lot of support on this resolution uh, last week or so, um, and it's important that they, you know, get to hear from some of the people today. We have a great group of testifiers, and, um, you know, it should be, uh, you know, it's just a great opportunity where we can uh, basically talk about some of the issues that we face here. So, Chairman, thank you for making the trip. Uh, Chairman Benninghoff is, uh, you know, when I first met him about 12, 15 years ago, uh, we, were, we were studying the flooding of the Delaware River. We were down in Monroe County, and uh, I met this gentleman who got off the bus, and he shook my hand, and he said, well, he said, I'm glad you're going to be a part of, uh, you know, coming to Harrisburg. And he said, he goes, I don't know, but he said, I don't think I'd build my house in this floodplain to begin with. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's a great chairman. Uh, he's, he speaks his mind, uh, and that's why we respect him so much. So, again, thank you for making the trip, and, and to, as well to my colleagues. Couple of housekeeping things before we start. If you have cell phones, please put them on vibrate. That interrupts. We are being videotaped. This is provided so that our members can review that we're not able to join us here and also you, the public. Uh, this will be made available to you. 
I think uh, Representative Fritz outlined things very well. We try to have a very strong, balanced hearings for the testifiers, and we are saddened that some of those that were invited to be part of this and be part of the dialogue in an open, transparent manner chose not to be here. Uh, last, if I would, I'm going to ask the members from my right to my left to just introduce themselves and where they're from, give you a little bit better geographic bound uh, outline area, uh, pardon me, outline from where they're from. Then we'll start with our pan first panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Stephen Bloom, State Representative from Cumberland County. Hi, good morning. Brian Cutler from the 100th Legislative District, which is Southern Lancaster County. I also serve as the whip for the Republican Party and have the privilege of having representatives uh, Fritz and Piper both as deputy whips. So thank you very much for sending them to work with us. Hi, good morning. Representative Aaron Cover, 120th District in Luzerne County. Good morning, State Senator Lisa Baker of the 20th District, which includes Luzerne, Wyoming, Susquehanna, Wayne, and Pike Counties. Thank you, Jonathan. Don Oberlander, I represent parts of Armstrong County, Forest County, Clarion County in the northwest of Pennsylvania. I'm a member of our leadership team as caucus secretary, and I am the uh, co-chair of the Gas and Oil Caucus. Will Tallman, I represent parts of Adams and Cumberland Counties. Good morning, everyone. Representative Dan Mouth from the 91st District. I represent part of uh, Adams County. Uh, it's easier if I just say home of Gettysburg. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Again, Chairman Benninghoff, I can't let that go. Home of the Nittany Lines, Penn State, and Miller State, so rock on. <laughs> and last week's loss was just an illusion. We didn't really lose. <laughs> Without further ado, we're going to start with panel number one. We have Brian Smith with Wayne County Commissioner's Office, Jim Barber, uh, Susquehanna County Farm Bureau, and Vince Phillips with Pennsylvania State Grange and Pennsylvania Septage Management Association. I must be missing one. I am. That's what you get for $3 glasses. We have Debbie Gillette, also here for the Chamber of Northern Poconos. Young lady, by my mother's orders, we will start with you and move to the right. If all the testifiers want to go ahead and give their testimony, then the members will ask questions. Good morning, Chairman Benninghoff and honorable committee members and Senator Lisa Baker. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Northern Pocono Mountains and thank you for granting us the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Debbie Gillette and I am the Executive Director of the Chamber of the Northern Poconos. We are the Chamber of Commerce that represents almost 600 business, businesses and organizations within Wayne and Pike counties. Our mission is to promote business, enhance economic and community development, and serve as a catalyst for improving the overall quality of life in the Northern Pocono Mountains. The Chamber of the Northern Poconos supports responsible economic development and the right of landowners to utilize their property. We support the property owners in Wayne and Pike counties and throughout the Commonwealth for the right to develop their land. We're not here today to debate the pros and cons of natural gas development. We are here to express the concerns that the Chamber has for the landowners and business owners in Wayne and Pike counties and for our entire membership. The Delaware River Basin Commission adopted a resolution on September 13, 2017 to prepare and publish a set of draft regulations to address natural gas development activities within the basin. Wayne and Pike counties are within the Delaware River Basin, which is comprised of 14,119 square miles throughout five states. Governor Wolf cast our Commonwealth's vote to, in favor of the resolution that will prevent Wayne and Pike counties from economic growth and prosperity. Governor Wolf voted to restrict the rights of our landowners. We feel that it is hypocritical to supporting a ban while our neighbors in Lackawanna, Susquehanna, and Wyoming counties and the rest of the Commonwealth enjoy the economic benefits of the natural gas industry. Our neighbors in Lackawanna County have business parks with natural gas infrastructure and are developing a billion dollar power plant that is attracting economic growth and jobs. The governor's opinion implies that it is okay to deny those same benefits to the people of Wayne and Pike counties. Our neighbors in, in the Susquehanna River Basin Commission have already concluded that widespread drilling 
in the much larger 27,486 square mile watershed has not adversely affected water quality. The SRBC is the primary water source for Harrisburg, our state legislators, and our governor. The fact that the SRBC has maintained an increased quality of water during natural gas exploration, fracturing, and production is an example of responsible economic development. For generations, Wayne and Pike counties have been good stewards of our land. We have maintained a high quality of water within the Delaware River Basin. We will continue to be conscious of our environment for future generations. Pennsylvania has a statewide economic development strategy based on the expansion of the natural gas industry. Governor Wolf has denied our counties the ability to participate in this strategy, and we feel this is unjust. He should be assisting us in the pursuit of economic growth, not hindering us. Why don't the citizens of Wayne and Pike County matter? Are we only to be the recreational playground for those who receive their income elsewhere? We need, to, we need responsible economic growth. We need economic stimulus, and here is why. Wayne County has the lowest per capita personal income in the seven county northeastern Pennsylvania region. Our per capita income of $37,444 is 75% of the state's average which translates into our people having to hold multiple jobs to make ends meet. Our average weekly wage of $723 is 67% of the state average of $1,078. This income disparity is due to the lack of diversity in our industry profile. We are very top heavy in low wage industries and lack the traditional economic engines such as higher education and large corporations to turn this around. We need the jobs that will be created, not just within the gas and oil industry. Jobs will be created and maintained within the following industries if there is no ban. In the hospitality industry, restaurants, caterers, hotels, campgrounds, long-term rentals, in the trades, electricians, welders, truck companies, equipment rentals and sales, landscapers, construct construction, building supplies, quarries and aggregates, surveyors and engineers, finance, banking, investments, financial advisors and wealth management, and in the retail field, fuel suppliers, grocery, farm equipment, heavy equipment, auto sales, office supplies, convenience stores, and clothing. The landowners in neighboring counties have reinvested the funds that they have received from developing their land within their property and local communities. They have purchased new equipment. They have remodeled their homes and outbuildings. They have constructed new buildings and have increased their livestock. Areas that were depressed are now thriving communities. We ask that the po House Policy Committee continue your investigations regarding the Susquehanna River Basin Commission and the Delaware River Basin Commission. We urge you to work with the state legislator within all parties and prove to the citizens of the Northern Pocono Mountains that our voices will be heard and that we matter. I'm Jim Barber, I'm a farmer from uh, Susquehanna County. I'm the vice president on Susquehanna County Farm Bureau Board. I'm also the District 1 uh, state representative on, on our uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau Board, so I represent Wayne, Pike, Susquehanna, Wyoming, and Lackawanna counties. Uh, I'm here to, uh, actually, as I echo the things that have already been said, I can speak more by experience. Uh, I am in the Susquehanna River Basin, and uh, we've been watching in our area the development of the gas industry. Uh, and on a personal testimony, uh, we were growing produce on our farm and some hay, and our son and daughter-in-law and grandchildren were with us. And as farming is today, it's very difficult to make a living. Uh, when the pipeline uh, was first coming across northern Susquehanna County, when it crossed our farm, our son hired on, and that was about seven years ago. Uh, he's had uh, a tremendous career, still working in the, the gas industry, uh, added more grandchildren and bought a house, now bought another house, and, and uh, farming can't support that kind of, uh, of, of income as what's available today in the gas industry. And so it has made an economic difference in a lot of ways in our area. 
Uh, our desire today is to see Wyoming or Wayne Pike to have the same opportunities that we do. Uh, it has made a difference in our farms. There are many farms who, have, who would be out of business if it weren't for an ad additional revenue uh, from the gas industry, an opportunity to buy the equipment that they haven't been able to update, uh, opportunities to be participating in best management practices that we didn't have the opportunity to afford without an additional revenue. Uh, so on a lot of levels, uh, agriculture has improved in our area because of the gas industry. Uh, also, our infrastructure has, has changed drastically. We have the best roads now that we have ever had uh, because the gas industry fixes, rebuilds, and takes care of our, our roads. Uh, a lot of our local businesses have grown. They've hired more people. Uh, our, our service stations, our gas stations, all of our, our eateries, and, and uh, there's just a lot of economic expanse uh, in our area because of the gas industry. Uh, as far as our environment goes, uh, I've participated uh, personally uh, on our properties and a lot of the expanse. We have pipeline across our property. We have a, a, a uh, compressor station on our property doesn't bother anybody. We haven't had any incidences. Everything is fine. Our water is good. I know one of the things that uh, often attracts a lot of attention, uh, but I would say that uh, people have been lighting water on fire in our area for the last hundred years. It's nothing new. And so uh, from a positive perspective, I've seen tremendous uh, impact in our area uh, from the gas industry. We appreciate what's going on in the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. And uh, we need fuel, we need food. Uh, this is an opportunity to help the farmer provide the food and provide the fuel uh, that we need for our country. And so my desire is to help support the farmers who are largely the landowners uh, that are, are of greatest impact uh, in Wayne Pike counties and to see that they have the same opportunity that we do uh, to make a difference. So thank you for being here, thank you for the opportunity. You may. And thank you for all being here. I first want you to know who I am so that you uh, can understand where I come from and you can understand the kind of people that I represent. I get up 3.30 every morning. I go get my cows. My son-in-law goes with me. We put them in the barn and milk them. And because you can't just make a living on a dairy farm anymore, I drive a school bus. My son-in-law is a, a surveyor. He goes off to work. We work very hard all day at a second job or a third job just to keep our farms going. This is the kind of people that I represent in Wayne County. This is the kind of people that largely loan, own land, that largely work here. They have this kind of work ethic. They appreciate freedom. They appreciate their rights. And they feel that they've earned these rights because these are the environmentalists. These are the people that have worked hard for the water quality that we now have. Water quality was not simply produced by EPA or DEP or the DRBC. This water quality was produced by people who care about their land people who are township supervisors who care about stormwater runoff, conservation districts who care about the people that work with them and they work with in, co in voluntary cooperation, NRCS who has worked with farmers for years to implement best management practices. These are the people who are responsible for the water quality that we have here in Wayne County. Except for one thing we never saw coming, we never saw the fact that we bought into a situation that created water quality that was more of a penal process than it was a congratulatory project, project or a feel-good project. Because what happened to us, and it's in the papers I have today from the DRBC, and they speak to how they've created exceptional value water, and they may have played a small part in that, and I won't say that they won't. They didn't. But with exceptional value water, Mr. Benninghoff, comes an elevated designation, an elevated um, 
restrictions, scrutiny, and, and, and it shuts us down. It shuts down our opportunity. That when we start talking about these um, resolutions, when we start talking about these uh, things that I have here, and I got plenty of copies, I'm gonna hand them out to you today. We start talking about regulations of gas that's being developed by the DRBC. We're gonna be told you're in an exceptional value watershed. We've been told this already. Well, we created this watershed. Not just me, me and the people who sit behind me that I represent, me and the people who work hard in this country, who work hard in this county, and work hard to feed our families. And there was a great Spanish philosopher that once said, those who cannot remember history are condemned to relive it. And what I speak about now is freedom. Freedom to own property. Freedom to be productive. Freedom to work hard. Freedom to put forth your ambitions and do better for your family. Freedom to have rights on your property to do with that property what you want to do after you purchase it. These freedoms are being robbed from us. These freedoms are being undermined and degraded. And as these freedoms are degraded, so is the very basic premise of coming to the United States in search of a better life. And I tell you all these things because I think it's incredibly important. National security, freedom, it's what we all once lived for. And I would hate to see us forget that history lesson and watch our children someday have to pick up arms and fight once again a revolution to fight for their freedom and have the freedom that we once had. It is better to maintain that freedom. It is better to retain that freedom, to ever have to fight for it again. And that's why I'm testifying here today. There's a few things that we've done in this country, all of us, and haven't even given it a thought. We did it because we thought it was cute. Mr. Benninghoff, and we did it because we thought it was entertaining. And we showed our kids from the time they went to school, movies like Littlefoot, like Fern Gully, things that demonize people who cut down trees, things that elevate the importance of our environment. And I've already stated to you how important I think the environment is. Our milk, Jim and my milk, is about 98% water. We have to have clean water. We have to have good water. But we have to have mommy and daddy able to make a living and raise our families and send our kids to college and move forward in this country. A little history lesson of Wayne County is, at one point in time, there are pictures in our museums where all the trees are cut down. You can see bear countryside everywhere because people in the cities needed to stay warm. They needed firewood. So we cut down trees and we sent it to the, to the cities, not just to build the cities, but to heat them. When they ran out of wood, we mined coal out of the mountains. We built a canal in 1829 that went from Roundout all the way to Wayne County. We loaded it with coal. Coal put this country as an energy source on the map, made us a superpower made us important in the world. Those are the things that we're talking about today when we talk about energy. This energy source is something that's clean. This energy source is something that can take us forward and provide opportunity and jobs. And good things will come from this. Many people, when they think about oil, think that oil is dirty. Well, I just recently this summer went to Titusville and I learned a few things about oil. First of all, crude oil, you can drink it. Most people don't know that. The Indians consumed it to help their bowels. They rubbed it on their skin to keep the mosquitoes off of them. The Indians are the ones that invented crude oil and, and found it and, and used to soak it up in cloths off the top of the water because that's where they found it, on the top of the water. They would then wring the cloths out. They found out they can burn it and use it in lanterns. They traded it to the Indians, or the Indians, I'm sorry, traded it to the settlers who took it back to the cities. When they found out that they were running out of whales and whale blubber, there was more of a push to go see if they could tap into this oil resource. When they tapped into the oil resource and found that they could capture it in large quantities, that saved the whales. 
It wasn't Greenpeace that saved the whales. It was the Indians and the people who discovered crude oil. They stopped killing whales for blubber, turning it to oil, using it in lanterns, and started using oil. Just a simple lesson in how something that is looked down on in many different instances did so many positive things. Look at the positive things that natural gas has done so far. How many people have, have saved a fortune, a fortune, in their winter heating bills because of the price of natural gas? How many people sitting right here today have plastics on their very self, plastics that come out of a cracker plant that are produced into so many different things? How many people can stand by and watch this shut down? We can't shut this down. This is an opportunity. This is the same kind of opportunity that was created way back when with the oil, way back when with the coal. And nobody back then said, well, this is dangerous. Let's not do it. Nobody said with oil, this is dangerous. Let's not do it. Nobody said with coal, we can't do this. People still go in mines. Yeah, there's an element of danger. There's an element of danger in everything we do. I was interviewed by the Philadelphia Inquirer. You can read it yourself. Now, I said a lot of things. They put very few things in there. But one of the things I said to them when they asked me, does this concern you that we might drill and frack and extract natural gas? And I said this to them. Let's put that into perspective. I have six children that jump in a vehicle every day, head down the road, and go to work. Does that concern me? Yes, it does. But we put into place speed limits and stop signs and registrations and inspections, and we do everything to try to make it as safe as we could possibly make it. But we move forward in this country, and we keep going, and we look to the future, and we look to still remain our our superpower status in the world. And we have an opportunity with natural gas to continue to do that now. So I say this, let's talk head on about safety. Let's talk head on about what it means to have a safe, responsible power source when you start looking at natural gas, natural gas conversion to electric, Compare that to the nuclear power plants. Look at Chernobyl's. Look at Japan. But yeah, we could stand by and say natural gas is too dangerous to drill. Fracking is dangerous. When you look at a nuclear power plant sitting in Oswego, New York, on one of the largest freshwater bodies in the world, and think that maybe that could be safer if that was a, an electric generation plant fired by natural gas. Three Mile Island, that almost had a problem once before. And look at the populated areas around there. And again, related back to Chernobyl's, acres and acres, hundreds of acres of land, thousands of people displaced because of dangerous power. But yet we look to somehow shut down natural gas. Why? What are we thinking? Those who forget history are condemned to relive it. We have to move forward in this country. We have to have a balance. When we're teaching our young children how important the environment is, we need to also be teaching them that we need jobs, we need industry, we need to be important in the world, we need to be productive, we need to have ambition, we need to work. And to work means success. And that has so many tangible arguments I could be here all day. But again, I want to say for the record, I believe in our environment. I work with our environment every day. I need clean water. I believe we can have clean water, a clean environment, and industry. Technology is something that has evolved so quickly and so far so fast that why would we ever put a permanent ban on anything. The evolution of water treatment. Incidentally, I am on the gas task force for the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania, and that's why I went to Titusville, and that's why I've heard all these different presentation by gas companies and about regulation and controls, and I'm fairly knowledgeable about them. 
But because I'm involved in that, I also get presentations all the time by people who treat water, water treatment, wastewater treatment, flow back. All of this has evolved so far so fast, and in a positive way, why would we ever put a ban on something? We can all remember what it was like when we were children, and we were all asked to shut off our phones. You know, this is Dick Tracy shit, right? Nobody ever thought it would happen. But we've evolved so far so fast, we can't ever ban things in this country, particularly when it has so many positives attached to it. So I do have for you today copies of the DRBC's paper that they put out on natural gas development background information. This was a, a DRBC news release, September 13th, 2017. They talk about why they're involved, so you'll have a copy of that. I also have a copy of a September 11th, 2017 announcement and it talks about the revolution that they're going to, or the resolution that they're going to vote on on the 13th. That was passed. I also have copies of the resolution for the minutes, so you know what the resolution actually says. And I have a copy of frequently asked questions that is published on the DRBC worksheet and on their website. And in, in, in these resolutions, where they talk about developing natural gas regulations. It does say, now there be it resolved, now therefore be it resolved, by the Delaware River Basin Commission that no later than November 30th, 2017, the executive director shall prepare and publish for public comment a revised set of draft regulations to address certain natural gas development activities within the Delaware River Basin. So let's hope that happens. Number two in this does say the draft regulations directed by the resolution shall include and seek comment on prohibitions. It doesn't say a ban. It says prohibitions related to the production of natural gas utilizing horizontal drilling and hydraulic fractioning within the basin. It goes on to talk about more things. Provisions for ensuring the safe and protective storage, treatment, disposal, and or discharge of wastewater within the basin associated with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing for the production of natural gas where permitted. That suggests to me that we all need to stay tuned, that we all need to stay engaged, that we all need to develop meaningful comment and meaningful commentary. Because maybe this isn't a ban. Maybe this is something that is just going to be balanced. I hope so. I hope I don't have false hopes. But I would also maintain that after this becomes regulation, <laughs> there's a downside. There will be a vote. And they'll vote the regulations in or they'll vote them down. So again, we need to stay tuned. We need to stay engaged. We need to have meaningful comment. We need to be aware. We need to be educated. And we need to stay up to speed on what's going on. In the frequently asked question, this is where I'm going to end it. It does say here on the third page, and you'll all have copies of this, the public is asked not to prejudge the proposed rules before their publication. So I'm trying not to judge the rules before their publication. But I am saying that I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I am saying that please try to appreciate the people in this country who still hold fast to the values of hard work, the values of family, the values of moving forward, prosperity. And please keep in mind that what this gentleman is true, said is true. Our farms cannot simply survive today on the price that we get for milk. Their farm's doing pretty good. Our farm is suffering. I have next generations, and this bothers me, I'm sorry. I have next generation farmers on my farm who want to continue farming, who can't afford to do it. Can't. So they're working two other jobs to keep going. This is an opportunity 
for agriculture today. The average age of our farmers are in the 60s now. No farmers, no food. No food, no national security. Anybody with a military mind knows if you can't feed your population, you've compromised your national security, and you can lose your homes. Thank you for being here today. This is an important topic, and I appreciate your attention. Before we uh, have Vince Phillips, I have to say I've sat through a lot of hearings over my years and listened to a lot of people passionately plead, but I will tell you, Brian, Jim, and Deb, your testimony has made this country boy's life better. Just sitting here listening, I look across this crowd and I see uh, what I hear when I listen to audio books about post-World War II individuals I hear, and I see what I uh, listen to when I see John Adams and Jefferson, those guys who came to a country and just wanted a better life. You know, in life in general, it is a small group that affects change, but I will tell you, there's a small, loud group who wants to put this industry completely out of business. They work diligently day in and day out to just squash the natural gas industry, to put a severance tax on because they think that they're owed something. I'll close these comments in reminding myself that uh, it is the farmers, the hunters, and the fishermen who were and always have been the greatest naturalists and the greatest environmentalists and the protectors of the land. And I think your testimony reminding us consumers who have, don't even understand where the products we consume every day come from Everything we use in our life is either grown by a farmer or mined out of the ground, period. Let's continue on with our testimony, but I want you to know that you have improved my life just sitting here listening to your words, and I thank you for that. Vince, tough act to follow, but good luck. Good morning. Now that I know that, that your day has been made, what could I possibly say that would darken your day? <laughs> uh, that you're from, you're from Harrisburg and you're here to help us. <laughs> Why well, shucks, it's the least I could do. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, Senator, I'm very glad that you held this hearing. I think it's very, very important. For the record, my name is Vince Phillips. I'm a registered lobbyist. On, I'm speaking today on behalf of two organizations. One is the Pennsylvania State Grange. The Grange was founded in 1873 to be a, an advocate for farmers and other rural residents. There are 61 local Grange chapters in the Delaware Valley Basin. So you can see there's a lot of impact on the members of that association. The second association is the Pennsylvania Septic Management Association. Those are the folks that deal with on-lot septic systems, but they also do other things too. For example, transporting waste from municipalities, all of which are a border the, the Delaware River and its tributaries. They also engage in responsible application of biosolids, which of course helps not only the agricultural community, but also provides a, a, a financial boon to municipalities that otherwise would have to find a more expensive way of disposing of their waste. So those are the two groups that I'm representing today. Now, I have to tell you, we are very, very concerned about what the, the Delaware River Basin Commission has done. It's our view that they over stepped their bounds to do things that they really should not have done. Now what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about the economic impact. I doubt, frankly, I can give as, as inspirational a speech as my predecessor. You know, that was very impassioned, but also very substantive. And I appreciate that, so I'm not going to try to do better than that, because I can't. <laughs> but I, I would tell you, though, that an economic downturn in the Delaware ba River Basin is going to have some very strong long-wrenching impacts. It's not a matter of just one county or two. It's a matter of 11 counties. And they include snippets of Lackawanna County, Schuylkill County, and even Lebanon County to the south. So we're talking about a huge area. I went to the, the, the Basin Commission's website and I was able to find a map that showed the counties included in the basin, but also showed an overlay of the, the potential fracking that could occur, i.e., where is there Marcello Shale deposits that could possibly be tapped for natural gas. 
two-thirds of the ground area of the basin is fracking possible material. That's where the shale is. It's not limited to one county or two. It's two-thirds of the entire basin. So if anyone from the Basin Commission or some of their advocates were to say, oh, this is a de minimis sort of thing, I would respectfully disagree. I would say that it has huge economic impact, frankly, in about one-fourth of the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, others before me, and I apologize for coming late so I didn't get to hear it, but others doubtless talked about the economic impact of Marcella Shale and what that means in terms of jobs, and not just direct jobs, but also the, the spin-off jobs that kind of feed into that industry. They probably also talked about the impact fees and the financial contribution made by natural gas development to the infrastructure of municipalities and counties. Can't say that they did, but I'm assuming that they did. And Debbie just nodded her head, so I guess I, I, guess I got it right on that one. But I would tell you that there's a huge impact here in this basin for economic development. If fracking is allowed to proceed, independent of what the Delaware River Basin Commission wants, you can see a real resurgence in this part of the state uh, that other parts of the state have already seen. And that helps Main Street, as well as helping energy companies, as well as helping the taxpayers. I would suggest to you that the authority spoken by the, the Delaware River Basin Commission the authority is not on sound footing. And what I did is I looked up the original compact, the 1961 compact, and I also looked up Act 268, which was passed by the General Assembly on July 7, 1961, to see what it said. And yeah, there's rhetoric in there that basically says that the, that the commission has a lot of authority, but there are other sections that seem to be ignored by the commission. For example, Article 1, 1.3, Purpose and Findings, says the purpose of this compact are to promote interstate comity to remove causes of present and future controversy. Well, I have to tell you, this is not the way to go about achieving comity or reducing uh, future controversy. Um, is cooperative planning? Anyone? No, what I see is an arbitrary exercise by an unelected body. That's what I see. Now, I will tell you that some would say that I'm playing semantic games. So let's, and I would say that, uh, of course, that it violates the spirit of the interstate compact. But semantics aside, digging a little bit deeper, there is another section, Article 5, Pollution Control. Nothing in this compact shall be construed to repeal, modify, or qualify the authority of any signatory party to enact legislation or enforce any additional concerns and restrictions to lessen or prevent pollutions of waters within its jurisdiction. To me, what this says is that there's a role for the Pennsylvania General Assembly. Now, I don't know what it says to you, but that, that message comes to me very loudly, very clearly. And it says there are limits to the authority that the commission has tried to take on for itself. Now, what's my backup of that? The backup is Act 13. Act 13, as you know, set forth the regulatory framework for natural gas development in Pennsylvania. And all, everything's in there. And of course, many of you were there when it was passed, so you know better than I do what's in there. But everything is there. Like Prego, it's in there. Uh, mandatory setbacks uh, to protect the environment, uh, bond requirements, uh, and all kinds of other restrictions, inspections by DEP, and of course, of uh, coverage under some of the federal statutes as well. Very well regulated. Now, of course, some may say DP is not doing its job, but I think that becomes an administrative issue as to oversight on DEP, as to if it's not doing its job, perhaps legislative overcut could help it figure out how to do its job a little bit better. But that's a separate issue. When you read the language, the language says that other entities, such as the General Assembly, have authority. Now, interestingly enough, what I did, I have to tell you, this was, this was tough to do this. I read all of Act 13. God help me. <laughs> what I was looking for was language exempting the Delaware River Basin Commission or the Delaware River Basin. And you know what? 
It's not in there. It's not in there. Instead, what's in there is um, the, the appendix to Title 58, oil and gas supplementary provisions of amendatory statutes, blah, 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 blah. You know all the citations. Application of law. The addition of 58 PACS Chapter 23 shall apply to all oil and gas deposits and oil and gas development activities and operations subject to the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth. Doesn't it sound kind of as if the General Assembly of Pennsylvania has authority over this? Again, that's what it sounds like to me. Now, going into Act 268. Now, that's language taken from the Compact. But the Act of uh, 268 of 1961, there's Section 7.4 talking about water management and says, a cooperative planning and operation the Commission shall cooperate with the appropriate agencies of the signatory parties and with other public and private agencies in the planning and effectuation of a coordinated program. And it says that the Commission shall not operate any project or facility unless it is first found and determined that no other suitable unit or agency is available. So what I'm saying is even if the Basin Commission somehow is recognized as having that authority, there are other state entities in Pennsylvania that are equipped to do the job, such as DEP, as I mentioned. In other words, I say to the, the, the Basin Commission, please do not usurp the legitimate authority of state regulatory agencies, as well as trying to usurp the authority of the Pennsylvania General Assembly. To me, that doesn't wash. Now, what's the conclusion? And this is where it gets, in my opinion, very sad. So I'm sorry to wreck your day, and I hope you won't be crying after I'm through with you. But I have to tell you that the saddest part of this whole process is that the vote was taken by people who should have recused themselves. New York's governor, no fan of fracking there. And so the governor of New York feels that what's good for New York is what's best for the people of Pennsylvania irrespective of what the elected members of the General Assembly say. The governor of Delaware. Last time I checked, there was no fracking in Delaware. Don't think there ever will be, because there can't be. They only have a slice of the basin. And yet they think what's good for New York, and Delaware, presumably, is great for the citizens of Pennsylvania. Again, bypassing you. Now, what about New Jersey? New Jersey abstained. By the way, I did contact Governor Christie's office to try to find out why he didn't vote, and I got no answer. So if you all hear it before I do, please let me know. Uh, I won't be holding my breath too long, though. And then, of course, there was one no vote, and that was from uh, the federal government. So what about Pennsylvania? Well, one thing I'll say about Pennsylvania's governor, Tom Wolf, is that he does keep his campaign promises. I dug up a quote that he made to, uh, uh, it was a, a WITF in State Impact Pennsylvania, May 8, 2014. Question, do you support any changes to any of the current moratoriums? Answer, there is a moratorium on the Delaware River Basin. I support continuation of that moratorium and I support a moratorium on drilling in any state lands and forests. In other words, he doesn't want to see fracking or drilling or natural gas development here, even as he's quick to say, I really want a severance tax on everywhere else. You know, I find that just maybe a tad inconsistent. The other thing is, and this is really the, the bottom line to me, is that a governor of a state chooses to openly flaunt an established statute i.e., maybe I'm the governor, maybe I like fracking, and maybe I don't, but regardless, there's a law on the books. And is this regarded by the governor as an end run? And my belief is that's what he thinks. And I think that is really the tragedy of it. Now, everyone probably has a view on fracking, pro and con, and here we talked about lots of impacts and that sort of thing. But, you know, frankly, I don't care whether someone is for or against fracking. 
when you look at the fact that a governor has abused his power by voting to do something that the General Assembly did not want him to do. Frankly, I hope you have some more oversight hearings, perhaps oversight hearings or maybe even legislation that says the governor of Pennsylvania cannot vote on a basin issue if it's contrary to the express statute passed by Pennsylvania. So that's my... And let the record show that his applause was louder. <laughs> that does not give you any more moments to talk. Uh, no, very good, Vince. I think that's a, a good reminder. And again, it's a good reminder that representative government allows the people that you folks elect to be governing you, not one executive officer. Questions? I'll start with uh, Senator Brown. Se Senator Brown is from the Lehigh Valley. Um, Senator Baker is I just want to make sure you, you knew that. Northeastern <laughs> Pennsylvania, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I was on a roll, too. I want to thank everybody for your passionate testimony and um, for sharing uh, specifically the information. And, and I'd like to start with Commissioner Smith, if, if you don't mind. Brian, you have passionately spoken on a number of occasions about the region and the landowners being good stewards of the environment. And you have showed examples, not just with what we're talking about today, but going back to setbacks on septic systems, setbacks on streams and, and the like. And, and so I, I, I think it's important to put into perspective that nothing that you or anyone has communicated, has indicated that you think we should change the high quality exceptional value watershed status. You've indicated that we have to go through a lot of high hurdles to address that for economic development and that it should be really looked at um, on a case by case basis that we shouldn't have broad rules statewide, that we should be looking at what does it mean specifically using best management practices. I think that's important for people to hear. You're not suggesting that we degrade the water in any way. And, and I think I, I would just ask you to address that because you have been, since I've known you, long, long champion of this is our economic development as well. And so can you talk about how you believe we, we can balance that appropriately um, at the same time, you know, protecting what we believe here. We're, we're good stewards of the environment, people here in Wayne and Pike counties. Sure, absolutely. And, and I'll use an illustration that just happened uh, not very long ago at all. In fact, is this summer. Uh, we had a, um, a, a family who wanted to put together a um, brewing company. And I think this is a perfect illustration because this brewing company is something that hires people it's agriculture. I mean, people don't think of beer as being agriculture, but it's grain. It's growing grain, it's hops. And this affected a lot of people, and it not only affected the people that are employed there today, it affected the people who were employed in building the company, building the physical plant, doing the excavation on the property. And so what happened there was it almost came to a screeching halt. And it almost came to a screeching halt because of some very, very simple language that was in place that a little bit of difference in earth disturbance would have pushed that family into an MPDES permit, a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Permit. The costs and the time delays that are related to that very permit on that project would have forced this family into making the conscious financial decision to go somewhere else. Now again, I believe in our water quality, and so do they. And thank God that they made a little noise, that they demanded that it be looked at, that our conservation district and DEP actually sat down together and took notice of exactly what was going on on that property, because the end result 
was DEP recognized that they didn't need a national pollutant discharge elimination permit because the disturbance that was there was not at the level that required that permit. And it was based on some decisions on the ground. So just going by the book, they would have gone somewhere else. But because they demanded that DEP meet with them, that the conservation district meet with them, that people get engaged in conversation, the end result was going to be anyway, if they went through with it, no additional degradation to the environment. And so they were able to accomplish that uh, brewery. It's a beautiful place. They make great beer. There's people employed there. And it was because they didn't just sit back and say, well, the regulation says that it's going to cost us a lot of money. We'll go somewhere else. And that's the problem is we can't have a situation where there's zero impact on the environment, but yet we're so high in our regulations that we're not looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis because people will end up taking their business somewhere else. And we need economic development and sustainability right here. I, I think that illustrates the challenges we face here in the Northeast putting together economic development projects, and, and I appreciate that. And the reason I ask you that question is as, as someone, whatever your position is on natural gas development, the decision by the DRBC to define what a project is, what a project is in this watershed, not only could it potentially impact oil and natural gas development, but it could impact the agricultural community. It could impact business across the board. And so the development of a project is significant. And, and I think you illustrate how that can be for us to knowing moving forward. Um, we, we also um, need to look at, and, and as someone who represents Susquehanna County, Jim, you certainly know, we have two disparate Pennsylvania here. One where we say natural gas development can be uh, environmentally done in an appropriate and safe manner over one ridge top. So if you live in Susquehanna County, you can look at your neighbors in Wayne County. Um, I, can you speak to um, that issue and, and, and the water quality piece? Because I know the Susquehanna River Basin Commission has put in place monitoring um, of water wells and water throughout the basin since the development of oil and natural gas. And they recently issued a report that indicated there was no impact to the water quality. And, and so people want to talk about water quality. Let's have that conversation, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Be glad to speak to that. Uh, the regulation process that we've seen, and again, I can go back to personal experience. Uh, we do have a, about a mile of pipeline that goes across our property. We have a compressor station, the Snake Creek compressor station sits in one of our fields. We ended up with that compressor station on our property because the, the setbacks and the requirements were so stringent that they kept coming down the pipeline to find a place where they could finally find some acreage where it could meet all of those, those parameters. And uh, so that's why it's on our property. Uh, and we're right not, not far from Snake Creek, which is only about four miles from the Susquehanna River flowing north uh, into New York State. Uh, but the regulations that we've seen, uh, the inspections that we watch, uh, not only uh, at the time of construction, but ongoing. There are people back all the time monitoring uh, and inspecting. Our, we need clean water, and as Brian said, we, we have been good stewards of the land. Our farmers have been good stewards of the land. Uh, I think sometimes we get blamed for some of the pollutants that aren't our fault, but uh, we, we need clean water. We love our land, and we have seen some uh, great regulations, if you would, that maintain that. Now, I think that we get overregulated too easily, uh, but we do have quality water, we maintain quality water, uh, and everybody downstream, and as it was said before, our water that goes by us ends up going through Harrisburg, uh, and uh, we have seen uh, no issues at all. I think that uh, 
the industry has been regulated uh, to a point, and I know early on there were some challenges, mostly because our area is different than any place else in the country they had worked. There was a learning curve. Uh, but since then, reality has set in. It's safe. Things are good. We haven't had issues, and, uh, and I, I would look to see it continue that way. And I have no, no fear at all, but what if you go over that hump and come on this side, uh, the same things would, would transpire here. Uh, the same clean water, the same environmental good practices. Uh, in, in our area, to begin with, there was a lot of fear. Uh, there was a lot of emotion uh, until the unknown turned into reality. And, and the more people saw what really took place and realized what it was and what it wasn't, uh, the emotions kind of went out of it and everything settled down. And, and we're seeing some real responsibility and some good clean water and good conservation practices. And uh, we have seen no, no issues at all. And I would like to see that on this side of the hump as well, if you would. As you all are aware, the Wayne County landowners have filed uh, a suit in, in federal court. And this is my final question. Um, I, I have uh, believed very strongly that our landowners' property rights um, are being infringed upon and that this would be an unconstitutional regulatory taking of their land. Um, and, and as I said, whatever your position is on the development, these individuals in this compact doesn't give the DRBC, in my judgment, the right to take individuals' property without, and I will say, without, as I looked at the language, that the commission uh, must pay for the taking. So uh, I think, you know, that is a very significant question and concern that needs to be answered, in my mind, for the landowners of northeastern Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you to Senator Baker. We have uh, Congressman Bloom, then Representative Mao and Tallman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, is for Jim. And Jim, in addition to serving on the Policy Committee, I serve on the House Ag and Rural Affairs Committee. So I was very interested in the impact of, of any policy on, on farming in Pennsylvania, which is our number one industry. Can you kind of contrast the, uh, or, or specify, I guess is the word I'm looking for, what farmers who are in the regions like Wyoming County where, where you can actually unlock those energy resources and use those to economically benefit your farm, what actual tangible things do farmers typically do, examples of what you can do, the scope and magnitude of that versus the farmers in, in counties where, where the, the resources are, are locked up, where the ban is in place, and the farmers can't do those things that are necessary to their, their success and their survival in, in farming? Just put some parameters of actual specifics, equipment, livestock, sure. uh, things of that nature. One of the great things that, that we have seen uh, in Susquehanna County in our area is, is an additional source of, of passive revenue. Uh, you know, Brian spoke of, of having the extra jobs, but extra jobs take away from the farm. Extra jobs take, takes time and energy away. Uh, to have the opportunity to be a part of the, the gas industry and to receive royalties gives you an opportunity to have a check without more investment of time, which gives you more opportunity to spend time on the farm. Uh, one of the sad things, and it was already addressed, that the, our average age of farmers is getting pretty old. In most places, the younger generations have already left the farm because it wasn't economically viable to stay there. And so uh, for those of us who are maturing, and are getting tired uh, <laughs> with farming, uh, and just just by virtue of, of age, it gives us an opportunity to have uh, be able to make some choices. Uh, dairy dairy is not a great way to go, but uh, in our area, there's a number of farms that have been able to put on beef herds that they could afford. They've been able to upgrade equipment. Uh, you know, a lot of farms that were running 30, 40 year old equipment now can buy something newer, some, some newer types of equipment to be involved in best management practices. Uh, that's been huge. Uh, there are some folks that uh, have been able to stay on the farm because economically they're able to do that. Uh, so we've seen some, some very positive things. Uh, 
Uh, there's been some, uh, some new houses built. The, there's some new trucks driving around. It does make a difference, but it's, it's, it's a choice is what it really comes down to. People can decide what they want to do, and we have the opportunity to make decisions with the opportunity we have. Not everybody in, is in favor of the gas industry, but we have in our area, we have the opportunity to say yes or no. We have the opportunity if we do say yes and it's there, we can decide what we want to do with the revenue that we get. My heart goes out to folks here that don't have the opportunity to choose. Therefore, they don't have the opportunity to decide what to do with the possibilities that's afforded them. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have uh, three other members to ask questions. I'm trying to keep panel. I know you've been here for a while. We'll get to our next panel. I'm actually going to leapfrog let Representative Fritz, then Mao and Tallman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Debbie, how many members do you represent? Currently, we have 578. Okay. And I, and I want to use you as a little bit of a litmus test here. When you expressed to your membership that you were going to testify here today and where your position was, uh, inform me where your members, uh, 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 where they were at as far as support versus perhaps uh, people that were critical. We had the majority that were very much in favor of our testimony today. There were a small handful that were against the fracking and natural gas development. But we stressed to them that our concern is the rights of the landowners, and then that is what they should be concerned with as well, with to do with their property what they see is best for their families. Would you say a small handful? Would you be willing to share a number? Two. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thank you, Representative Fritz. You make a good prosecutor. Uh, Representative Mile. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief. I've got one question and one statement. Brian, has your, your county commissioners ever uh, considered passing a resolution condemning the DRBC for even bringing this thought about of the, uh, the ban? Uh, uh, hasn't come up. No, may I suggest that? But in any event, uh, Vince, you, I think, stuck your toes in the water of exactly where we as a General Assembly need to go. Uh, there's a gentleman sitting behind you that knows very well what we're trying to do uh, with the SRBC to get their, uh, their unfeathered uh, control under control or authority uh, under control uh, and what we have in both the SRBC and DRBC is coming, becoming quite obvious that we have uh, non-elected bureaucrats making decisions uh, for an elected body. Uh, that being said, I, I'm extremely hopeful with what we are planning to do as, an organ as a group of legislators that's looking at the SRBC real hard is to uh, actually abide by the, the, the compact where it says that the, the, the commission cannot uh, perform a duplicative duties or redundant services that's already provided by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So if need be, and I'm hoping that we can get cooperation in the House and Senate to la literally, by law, by statute, move these services and decisions to, and God help me, I never thought I'd hear myself saying this, move them to DEP. <laughs> so I think, <laughs> I, I think, I think that, that that would have to be the way to go because the, these compacts have uh, overstepped their bounds so much. But I just wanted to get that in there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you wanted to respond to that, Vince. First of all, that was the big news flash of the day. <laughs> uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to say that the, the thing about the Susquehanna Commission, uh, I was talking to a, a representative whose district includes that. And she told me that, that one of the things that really upset her the most was a ski resort that had a pond where um, they had a fine they had to pay or a fee they had to pay of $10,000 on the water in this pond that they owned. And, and I don't know all the legalities connected with that. I'm sure there's, there's a big backstory. But it occurred to me that the problem with these basin commissions, particularly the Delaware River 
Space and Commission, is that they think they're all about WOTUS, Waters of the United States. The regulation that the Trump administration is, has been reviewing and pulling back from, I think these folks believe that they still have the ability and authority to do WOTUS here, which means if they regulate all the water and a project is defined as anything they choose to do, they could, in addition to banning fracking, they could say, oh yeah, and we don't like this type of truck that's used to transport X, Y, Z. I guess we'll get rid of them. And oh yeah, we don't want a pipeline going through because of environmental concerns. And oh yeah, we don't want application of biosolids. And we don't want a, a, a responsible use of, of treated waste from municipalities. In other words, it is a real issue of, of authority. It is, they are the ones who are setting their own rules of behavior, independent of you as the General Assembly. You could get me, you could get me fired up and I could wax a motive, but, uh, but, but I do think that, that, that power has got to be reined in. I was very gratified to see that one of the budget bills signed into law uh, reinforced the idea of an independent audit of the finances of the Basin Commissions. So I'm very glad to see that that's been codified in statute. Although if, if Governor Wolf sees my testimony, he'll say, damn, how'd they let that one get by? <laughs> but, but still though, at least that's a good step in the right direction because I don't know if this is true or not, but anecdotally, I'm not sure that even though the compact says that there will be independent audits, I'm not aware that there has been one, or at least not one initiated or directed by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They've only ever done their own. Okay. And then we're supposed to take that at face value, but we had put in this language this year that it would be done by the Auditor General. So we took their money and, and steered it there. But, and I know I'm, we're running late, but just you said something that these people probably all have question marks in their head. I'll just clarify it, just to give you an idea. And I don't know if they do it in the DRBC, but the SRBC, what Vince stuck, stuck his toe in there was they're, they're about raising money for themselves to grow their, their compact bigger and more powerful. They're growing a little empire. They're now down to charging people like businesses like golf courses that pull water out of the ground out of their wells, um, ski resorts that pull water out of their wells, put it in their own ponds, use it to make snow. Next on the agenda will be your dairy farms because you use a lot of water on a dairy farm. They're literally charging them for the amount of water that's coming out of their own well and then they're charging them evaporation rate on the pond. And that is, that it, to me, it's about raising money. So we've got to get them under control. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Benninghoff, may I have a chance just to respond to what- Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Mall. You asked me if we, uh, you know, had a resolution condemning the DRBC for their action. Um, we as a board of commissioners have worked with the DRBC when John was there uh, we've gone and testified down in New Jersey to the DRBC, uh, and we've been in constant communication with them, bringing back upgraded evolutions of water treatment and talking to them about the water treatment. And so, you know, we've never found the wisdom in a resolution to condemn the DRBC, so to speak, but continue to try to keep them educated on the issues that we're educated on with the hopes, again, not prejudging the regulations, hoping the regulations come out that allow for uh, the production and the drilling and fracking of natural gas. Thank you, Brian. Representative Tallman, then we'll be closed out by Representative Overlander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vince, spot on on your comments. And I've seen Dan and I, we're, we're working on Staff back there, by the way, the four of you are going to be developing legislation after this hearing. Uh, so I'm going to say one comment, then I have a specific question for Debbie. Uh, the same environmental folks that you have dealings with uh, were condemning the fracking in the Pine Creek Valley, <coughs> polluting the stream. 
And I'm a native brook trout fisherman, and I have a favorite stream that's a tributary to Pine Creek. I'm not telling anybody out in that audience which one that is. <laughs> and so I, at my own expense, went up and did testing, took water samples, sent them off to Penn State. This is an exceptional value stream, and uh, they come back negative. No impact by the fracking industry on, on that little stream. So, Debbie, I, I kind of want some numbers from you, if I could get it, because uh, we have seen what has happened with at Mihapani with uh, natural gas and the Procter Gamble plant. Uh, can you give me similar things that you could see happening in Wayne or Pike counties? Actually, we don't have a lot of industry currently. Our main industry, besides the agriculture, is tourism. And we actually could see this as not just an expanse on the tourism. I've traveled throughout Susquehanna County. I have a son that currently lives in Susquehanna County. I haven't seen any negative impact on your tourism industry. If anything, it's increased awareness of tourism in your area. Um, we would actually like to see our railroad be able to thrive again and build industry back along the railroad where we have empty square footage industrial space that you know we can have active freight again on our railroads. We could build many, many industries if the natural gas development does take place in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tolman. Representative Oberlander. Thank you, Chairman. And I want to first say thank you to all four of you. What a wonderful job you've done in testifying today. And something that one of each of you have said has impacted my thoughts and in, in the reason that I said that I needed to say something. So first of all, I, I just wanted to say that I'm from Northwest Pennsylvania where we've been fracking for 150 years. Thank you, Commissioner, for bringing that up. I know that you can drink crude. I know that it's, made, it's used in your makeup and your chocolate and it's, uh, it's very important to our state's economy. Um, we have plenty of abundant, clean water and green space. Well, I welcome you to come there anytime. And uh, I would just say that in your comment, Commissioner, about when you were asked by the uh, newspaper if you're afraid of, the, of this fracking, I am more afraid of not having the fracking. And I say that because we have seen prices of gas at $14 a decatherm not too long ago, where you were literally seeing businesses having to close their doors, jobs going away. And I think that it, it, it's a true fear that if we run this industry out of business, that our other businesses will be impacted. We've seen our economic investment and job creation truly stymied in this Commonwealth because of overregulation. And I just wanted to commend all of you and thank you very much for taking a stand against the DRBC because it's not just a drilling ban. You've said it, it's not just a drilling ban. It could be your next building permit for uh, another hen sh shed or whatever you call them. Um, it, it's important that you stand up for your freedom and we are here standing up with, with you for your freedom. So thank you very much. Commissioner, you, Commissioner Smith, in a uh, spirit of semantics and maybe some levity, uh, you brought up prohibit versus ban. And I'll apply that with my 14-year-old daughter. My 14-year-old daughter is both prohibited and banned from dating. <laughs> so uh, in that scenario, she is disallowed. So, just wanted to draw that connection. Thank you for being here. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. I hope your wife doesn't have veto power. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could I, uh, could I just, uh, just make a very brief statement, though? We um, enjoy brief statements. That concludes my brief statement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a slightly expanded version of that. Um, Senator, I was particularly intrigued by, by you talking about property and landowners' rights. And it occurred to me that maybe some legal research should be done on what is property and what is use of property and what is potential use of property? Because if the compact says that land will be seized but justly compensated, it seems to me that preventing an economic use of land also represents a considerable harm to the property owner and that potential 
loss should also be compensated. Now I'm going to let attorneys figure that sort of thing out, but that, that's kind of what uh, kind of triggered in what you said. The last thing I wanted to say is that in terms of people wanting water quality, you know, it's like where do members of the Grange live? They live next door. Some are farmers, some are business people, some are retired. How about the Pennsylvania Septage Management Association? I, I went down the list, there are probably over 100 members of that association doing work in the Delaware River Basin. And you know where they live? They live in the basin. They work in the basin. Their customers live and work in the basin. And so those two entities, the Grange and the septic management people, have a very strong vested interest in keeping water clean and pure. We also have a very strong interest in making sure that nobody abuses their power. And, that's, and I wanted to make sure that, uh, of course, at that point was stressed. But thanks again for, for holding this. I appreciate it. Very good. And thank you to this panel. Excellent testimony and very enriching and helpful with cute, but good balance perspective to everything. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope you'll stay listening to the second panel. While our lovely assistant Bob Nye gets new names prepared here. Our second panel is uh, Thomas Shepstone, Shepstone Management Company. Jim Reifler, Wayne County Farmer, Anthony Ventello, uh, Progress Authority, and also Ned Lang, the Upper Delaware River Basin citizen. Get these people assembled. We'll try to stay on track here. Thank you, Vanna. As we uh, prepare here in a bipartisan manner, we will go uh, left to right this time instead of right to left. Uh, Tom, if you want to start us out, we'll continue through and hopefully Tim can join us at the time. Thank you. If you could just push your button on Sorry. the black stem, and as long as it's bright green, then that means the uh, there we go. TV crew can hear you as well. Okay, I'll start over. My name is Tom Shepstone. I'm a professional planner from here in Wayne County. I have over 40 years experience uh, working with communities throughout the Commonwealth. I also represent numerous private clients, including some in the natural gas industry, and I previously leased my own land for gas drilling. But unlike anyone in western Pennsylvania or the, Sus or the Susquehanna River Basin, I am unable to participate in the development of the natural gas resources I own. My rights have been stolen and I repeat that, they've been stolen by the Delaware River Basin Commission and the people to whom they cater, which are not people from Wayne and Pike counties. The DRBC has over the last two decades been accumulating power to itself over land use and economic development with metastasizing regulations and fees that are rendering state governments, you folks, more and more irrelevant. The DRBC compact between the states of Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and PA and the federal government was signed in 1961. And nine years later, the Susquehanna River Basin Compact between Maryland, New York, PA, and the federal government was signed. The majority of both commissions, the SRBC and the DRBC, consists of the same three agencies. The Army Corps of Engineers for the federal government, the Department of Environmental Conservation for New York State, and the Department of Environmental Protection for Pennsylvania. The respective com uh, compacts are also similar in that they are subject to identical reservations. And I'll just briefly uh, quote part of one. Notwithstanding any provision of the Delaware River Basin Compact and the DRBC, the Delaware River Basin Commission shall not undertake any project other than a project for which state supplied funding only will be used beyond the planning stage until such commission has submitted to the Congress such complete plans and estimates for such project as may be necessary to make an engineering evaluation of such project. And then it goes on to talk about the financing of the project. 
Um, this language is of particular significance because it illustrates precisely what Congress and the states, including Pennsylvania, had in mind when they created both river basin commissions, water projects. Not land use, but water projects. They were crafted with the intent to pursue joint development of water supplies for drinking, for commercial and industrial uses, that is to say economic development, for electric power, and for recreation. It was anticipated the parties would work together to develop resources to meet the, growing, the needs of the growing regions with competing demands for water. It was expected the river basin commissions would keep their noses out of state business, your business while facilitating cooperative development of new and improved projects to supply more water. There is no indication of intent to give the, SRB, the DRBC or the SRBC, for that matter, control over every water resource. If, no joint funding is, if joint funding is not involved, in fact, these river basin commissions are legislatively directed to stay out of the way. They have no authority to pursue such projects. Yet today, they are regulating ever more of our daily lives, and now the DRBC wants to abscond, truly abscond, take, as, as Lisa said, our mineral rights and regulate anything it wishes down to the hairs on our head if we take showers. The DRBC has already made itself an empire with $30 million in the bank by charging fees for anything and everything while also ripping off its member states, your state, our state, for contributions that ought to be reduced to zero. Now the agency is slowly but surely extending its control over land use by suggesting it can require permits for any amount of water use in the DRBC region if it's connected to certain enterprises, such as natural gas development, or even no water use in the case of pipeline development. They even now propose prohibiting natural gas development in the DRBC region by formalizing an effective moratorium they accomplished by pretending to engage in the development of regulations with no end in sight after seven years. The sovereignty of the states themselves, your power, your individual power, your collective power, our collective power, our sovereignty is at stake as the DRBC grabs more power and establishes itself as overlord over the Commonwealth. Worst of all, it's been done with the acquiescence of two states, New York and our own Pennsylvania. Governors Cuomo and Wolf seem only too pleased to surrender their own authority so they don't have to make decisions themselves. Moreover, they've taken the phrase double standards to a whole new plane with the disparate treatment of the DRBC and the SRBC, both of which they effectively control yet treat totally different. And let me just ad lib here a little bit that your representative on the DRBC and the SRBC is the same individual, Jennifer Orr. Jennifer Orr speaks for both commissions. How does she justify voting one way on the SRBC where the water quality is acknowledged and she has to know, has to know that it has no impact and then vote the other way on the DRBC. The answer is the governor has told her what to do and she doesn't have the courage to say otherwise or perhaps her job's at stake. I probably shouldn't be too personal. But, but the fact is the governor has told her what to say and she's doing it like a good soldier. And it's wrong and it's taking away our rights and I share in Brian's passion about that issue. How can they do that to us? How can they vote two different ways and treat the water you drink as somehow less important than the water that we drink or that New Yorkers drink and elevate the importance of New Yorkers over us? That's what this is really about. And the corruption that we see in this, this action by Cuomo and Wolf is to be expected from New York because everything there since the days of St. Tammany is special interest politics. It's the only form they know. But we've been better in the past at least. And the, DRB, the D.C. commissioner there is the puppet of those special interests. But we have traditionally operated different in this Commonwealth, and you know that. We have, we have, you know, we've had our ups and downs and our bits of corruption, but overall, our DEP has traditionally been more independent. It has not been subject to uh, governors telling it what decisions to make. And now we've crossed that threshold. Now we have a governor telling a DEP employee who represents two different commissions to vote two different ways. And it's wrong. It's time Pennsylvania started protecting the rights of all Pennsylvanians from this power thirsty agency, stopped funding the beast, and laid the plans to pull out of it so our future is not determined by New Yorkers. Thank you.
Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Anthony, if I may, and Ed, we're just going to go down the line again, let you testify, and then have the members ask questions. Thank you. Proceed as you're comfortable. Good morning, members of the committee. I thank you for the opportunity to present testimony. My name is Anthony Ventello, Executive Director of the Progress Authority. We are a certified economic development agency chartered in Pennsylvania as a general purpose authority, industrial development authority, and industrial development corporation focused by county contract in all of Bradford and Susquehanna counties. We are in our 25th year and I have been there since the organization's formation. Much like yourselves, we are a group of private business and public officials who actively support investment and employment opportunities. Approximately nine years ago, natural gas development began in the Susquehanna River Valley. To date, Bradford and Susquehanna counties are the two most drilled upon counties with the highest production of natural gas comprising 38 percent of Pennsylvania's total natural gas production. Initially, we strove to educate ourselves by gathering information and traveling to many locations in the U.S. and Canada. We have also hosted numerous visitors from Asia, the Ukraine, Australia, South America, Canada, and Europe. We aggressively pursue the impacts of natural gas development specifically to understand its relationship to communities, our local government, our environment, education, agriculture, and economic development. Our greatest educator has been the last nine years of history. I live, work, and raise the family in the Marcellus Gas Play. I can stand before you as a rural professional, father, and community participant, and enlighten you as to the impacts of natural gas drilling to our community and state. I have prepared and given several testimonies to citizens and legislators such as yourselves. In September of 2016, I had the honor of presenting the United States Congress Committee on Science, Space, and Technology a copy of that PowerPoint in front of you. I am not going to review it, this presentation at this time today will, uh, because time today will not allow. However, the positive community and economic development impacts are prolific. Uh, I was amazed how uninformed the Congress was with regards to the issues. Uh, as a result, much needed infrastructure has been developed in forms of public water, sewer, clean power, broadband development, natural gas distribution, two new hospitals, clean self-sufficient cogeneration, combined heat and power, and compressed natural gas public transportation. Specific funds for housing improvements and first-time homeowner programs, recreation, environmental conservation, public safety, and two new 911 centers, and the development funds that, ha that as of this month includes a new nonprofit revolving loan program. We are now seeing jobs and investment with value-added vertical integration of natural gas for power generation, CNG, compressed natural gas, liquefied natural gas, and gas to liquids. This demands huge investment. Pennsylvania's future lies with focusing on value-added natural gas as not to treat this resource like a third world country by completely exporting this, variable, this valuable resource. We must maximize its full potential in our state. We need to develop a statewide energy policy to embrace and target its development and use. Like milk and timber, let's make cheese and hardwood cabinets before it leaves our state. A moratorium will not promote this prosperity. Uh, just as a side note, I, somebody did mention something about railroad, which I completely forgot about. Railroad has been thriving. We've seen uh, 47 miles of railroad completely replaced. Uh, we've gone from 1,200 cars to 10,000 cars a year, uh, both in Bradford and Susquehanna counties. Uh, and, we, and we've seen uh, the, the fourth of uh, three existing uh, transloading facilities being uh, created in the area. Uh, and obviously, it helps with truck reduction and the movement of uh, what is heavy materials. The confusing aspect of the Marcellus Shale region is that it is ge geographically defined. This limits the practical knowledge of many of our state residents, unlike states that have decades of experience. I contend that in order to fully understand and embrace the industry, one must truly recognize the ge geographic differences and not the similarities of, of other Pennsylvania shale gas development areas, non-Pennsylvania, excuse me. Amazingly, we are seeing the, that agriculture in our region is on the rise. Recent data from Penn State Agricultural Extension and the USDA show our agricultural production stable and rising. 2001 to 2008, dairy cow numbers were declining. The same time natural gas development arrived. Natural gas has provided income to farmers to, to reinvest in the farm, purchase new equipment, building improvements, pursue new markets, diversify and acquire additional land. Bradford County, and Susquehanna County are among the top 10 or, and, and one of the top two in dairy producers with large farms <coughs> and, 
and the other nine have no gas wells. That's in the southeast part of the state. Increase in corn, soybean, beef, swine, poultry, egg production, and niche farming like maple syrup and orchards, et cetera, are being experienced. The future of agriculture is bright for our region with land abundant, abundant water resources, existing farm services, and proximity to market. This is God-given, just like the proximity of the Marcellus Shale to service the eastern megalopolis of the, of the United States. As previously said, people need food and energy. As county planner prior to my current position for 11 years, now I'm showing my age, I contend that natural gas has been a complementary land use, has kept land in large parcels, which is conducive to agriculture and wildlife, which maintains a rural style of life. It also has enhanced tourism. As a sportsman, I can attest that the river fishing on the Susquehanna is great with abundant smallmouth walleye and other species. Deer and small game hunting is fantastic as, as Bradford and Susquehanna County still are uh, top harvest counties. And I must commend those for here, that are here today because there's a lot of rut activity going on in this county right now. While maintaining the most gas wells, uh, I appreciate um, my greatest fear is that a moratorium was to, was to permanently ban nat natural gas development in the Delaware River Basin. That economic prosperity and its benefits to rural Pennsylvania would be stripped from this region and that attempts will be made to enact moratoriums in other un uninhibited river basins and watersheds experience the positive impacts of natural gas development. I believe our greatest opportunity is beneath us to balance Pennsylvania both as a leader in, opportu in opportunities for business development in concert with a very high quality of life. I thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony and will be available with any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ventello. Uh, Chairman uh, Benninghoff had to step aside for a moment, so we're gonna go to our next testifier, Mr. Ned Lang, and then we'll have questions at the end. Good morning, and thank you for uh, allowing us to come before you and speak. I come, I come before you today as president of the Upper, Delaware, the Upper Delaware River Basin Citizens Association, who represents the landowners in the Delaware River Basin, their rights, their lifestyle, heritage, and business interests and as a vice president of the Pennsylvania Septage Management Association, whose membership touches everyone's life in the basin on PA soil. As we service, maintain, and treat the private, commercial, and municipal septage and wastewater produced throughout the Pennsylvania watershed of the Delaware River Basin. What has been a slow crawl by the DRBC of encroaching on the rights of landowners throughout the basin while quietly filling their coffers to the tune of $30 million in assets has suddenly taken on a velocity that is startling and consequently drawn the attention of everyone both within and outside the Delaware River Basin. I believe this is a direct result of the federal lawsuit that was brought against the DRBC by landowners in Pennsylvania whom finally have called out the DRBC concerning their purposeful stall tactics concerning well pads and fracking. Since 2011, the DRBC has been promising regulations concerning fracking, and now they want to ban fracking, which was their intent all along. While the DRBC has amassed tens of millions of dollars in assets on the backs of the hardworking taxpayers throughout the entire basin, they punished the landowners in the Upper Delaware River Basin by wrongfully taking their right to safely explore for natural gas in the states which allow it. The hypocrisy of the activity of the DRBC is astounding because three of the five state delegates also sit on the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, which has allowed for the exploration of natural gas for over a decade while the water quality in the Susquehanna River has consistently improved. This is evidenced by the 2013 SRBC Executive Director's report which states the following. Based on analysis of SRBC's nutrient sediment monitoring program, the health of the Susquehanna River Basin overall is improving. Why is it then that the same three delegates on the SRBC won't allow fracking on the DRBC? I will tell you why. Control is power and the DRBC has built in their own funding source as a result of their interpretation of their charter. They're building some wastewater treatment plants, sums of seventy to eighty thousand dollars just to review expansion plans and then they have which have already been approved by their host states environmental regulatory agencies. Please understand that the DRBC is a rogue federal commission that is acting far outside their charter and the regulations and requirements which they mandate are not derived from a democratic process such as the state of state's environmental laws have been, which Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's constitution mandates. The DRBC answers to no one consistently. 
other than special interest groups, which is why they have transitioned into this bully who has no concern for anyone, anyone's state laws, regulations, or sovereignty. Things need to change and change now. In this panel, as well as other legislators and congressmen and women, both in Pennsylvania and across the river, need a huge thank you for recognizing the threat the DRBC represents and your intent on reversing abduction, the abduction of landowner owner rights and Pennsylvania sovereignty by the DRBC. Our organization, the UDRBC, has authored the following letter which has recently been sent to every Pennsylvania State Assembly person and State Senator. We have also copied all congressmen and women and senators in New York and Pennsylvania whose districts include any part of the Delaware River Basin. And we are asking the Delaware River Basin the following questions. This was addressed to Executive Director Steve Tambini. And this was just sent by snail mail because um, we wanted to make a bigger impact because we wanted sending it by email I think was just too easy. So every one of you will have this letter in your inbox. Dear, dear Mr. Tambini, the Upper Delaware River Basin Citizens Association is an association of landowners who have joined together to protect our rights, ensuring our economic viability and social culture for generations to come. It has come to our attention that the DRBC has begun billing commercial landowners for septic permits, which are already regulated by and under the purview of the Pennsylvania DEP or New York State DEC. We are requesting answers to our concerns regarding this. Where does the DRBC derive the authority to do this? What exactly is the DRC permitting? What is the standard or threshold for what is acceptable? What are the guidelines and from, and from whence did they originate? How does the DRBC arrive at the amount billed to municipal, industrial, and commercial users who have speedies permits and are already billed for their speedies permits by their host states' environmental regulatory agencies? Does the, D, D, does the DRBC have a formula or, or rate sheet for permits administered by the DRBC? If so, our organization would like a copy of those documents to review for possible comment. How much money is generated on a state-by-state -state basis as a result of the DRBC billings for the DRBC discharge permits? How does the DRBC budget revenue, budget revenues generated by these discharge permits or usage permits? How does the DRBC justify the redundancy and the double billing for this? Does the DRBC also charge entities for water uses in the basin? And we are actually anxiously awaiting your response in a timely manner. We all know at this point that taking the rights of landowners for safe natural gas exploration and extraction is just their first step in the abduction of landowner rights in the Delaware River Basin. If they are successful in their ban on natural gas exploration, then their intent is to oversee all forms of human activity within the basin. In fact, their court papers state this emphatically. The DRBC has stated that the construction of a well pad is a project. And they now have interpreted the language refer which refers to a project in their original charter as any human activity that has the potential to impact the water quality in the basin. Folks, we are in trouble. If they are allowed to get away with this, and it's not about the water quality, they couldn't care less unless it affects their bottom line and negatively, negatively impacts their hoard of money. I can prove this sad testimony on the true intent of the DRBC and the carelessness and neglect they have con and continually show towards the quality of the drinking water which they are supposed to be protecting. So now I want to talk to you about the Old Barnes Landfill. Uh, the Old Barnes Landfill is a landfill that was um, started around 19, uh, late 1950s, early 1960, uh, about a half a mile from the Delaware River in Berryville, New York. I have a good sized environmental company and in the late 90s my company was asked to come in and assist in the closure of this landfill. Um, this landfill, when I used to work for Kittatinny Canoes, I was up there every day with the garbage and it had every, it was an old landfill, it had old cars and trucks and batteries and refrigerators and oil and you name it, everything went in the landfill. It was the way it was back in the day. Mind you, this landfill is on a mountain, on a mountainside overlooking the Delaware, a half a mile from the Delaware River in Berryville, New York. So my company was brought in when Mr. Lugori, his firm bought this landfill, and then the DEC decided to shut it down. So his company was uh, blessed, if you will, not so much, but they were charged with the, um, with the responsibility of closing this landfill. So at the very bottom of the landfill, there was one road in, one road out, and it was very steep and very tough to get trucks in and out. And there, was a, there were holding tanks. There were, I think, 20 or 30,000 gallons in holding tanks at the bottom of the hill. 
and you could only get one truck in and one truck out. They had capped the landfill, but what happens in a large rain event is that you can't possibly keep up with the flow of the leachate coming out of this landfill. This is raw leachate, untreated. You can see the oil, you can, it has a lot of pollutants in it. Well, we had a big rain event and, uh, and the water, we couldn't keep up with the water coming out of the, uh, the, the holding tanks and Mr. Liguori was charged with a class, two, class B felony by the New York State DEC for discharge. One event, one rain event, he was charged with a felony. Not long of that, uh, after that, Mr. Uh, Liguori passed away. Mr. Liguori had $150,000 in contingency fees, a bond, if you will, to close the landfill. So we kept on hauling the water out of the landfill, the leachate, I shouldn't say water, the leachate. Until one day the DEC said, uh, we're out of money. We're not gonna haul the water anymore, or the leachate. And I said, what are you gonna do with the leachate? It's not gonna stop coming out of that manhole. And it flowed right across Kittatinny Canoe's campground into their stream down to the river. Well, Mr. Lang, we're not gonna do anything. You're done, you're out. So I said, okay, so I wrote a letter to Governor Cuomo. And I addressed this letter in June 10th, 2013, as part of your record, my office has uh, submitted it to you. This letter, I'm just gonna read you the one excerpt. But in this letter, I addressed every member of the uh, DRBC at that time. Every member state, every attorney general. Uh, uh, Carol Collier was addressed. The UDC was addressed. And let me read the one excerpt, excerpt out of it. And this is the Governor Como, and, the, and the, uh, the title of the letter is What Happened. I've written, I've written you numerous letters in the past year and a half pointing out just how hypocritical you are when it comes to protecting New Yorkers and our fellow Americans downstream in the Delaware River Basin. I have learned that there is not one landfill Superfund site, but two landfill, super sites, uh, landfill Superfund sites in the Delaware River Basin that are spewing their hazardous compounds into the drinking water of millions of people downstream. In March of 2011, Willie Janeway, the director of the New York State DEC Region 3 Department of Environmental Conservation, came to my DEC Part 360 permitted solid waste facility, and we traveled down to the Old Barnes Landfill in Berryville, New York, and we walked through the site. I showed him exactly where at the base of the landfill a large holding tank would overflow, dumping thousands if not millions of gallons of uncontaminated, of contaminated hazardous waste effluent from the collection system down through the woods, causing numerous private properties in the brook and shortly crossing numerous private properties in the brook and shortly thereafter into the Delaware River. Mr. Janeway assured me that the New York State DEC would be taking some sort of action to mitigate this problem and prevent these chemicals and pollutants from entering the drinking water of millions of Americans downstream. To date, nothing has been done and this landfill continues to spew its, spew its pollutants into the Delaware River on a daily basis for the past decade. You can also go onto YouTube, and I went down there and I took a video of it. And you can go to the Barnes Landfill YouTube and you can see the water, the leachate, coming from a super fun site a hazardous waste site flowing out of this manhole, as still is today, directly into the Delaware River. The DRBC doesn't give two hoots about cleaning this up, nor neither does the DEC, and the DEC is the one that permitted the landfill and refuses to do the right things to mitigate the problem because they don't want to spend the money. But the rest of us are held to a different account, a different level of commitment, if you will. God forbid one of us did this. Mr. Liguori got a class B felony for one instance. It's still happening today. So I leave you with this thought. What's happening with the DRBC is just the start. This is their test ground. Mind you, there's three delegates, as every, almost everybody has said, on both of the SRBC and the DRBC board. This is about the taking of our rights. This is about the state's sovereignty, the state's laws. The state's laws were put forth by a democratic process. The DRBC does not operate like that. They operate under special interests. And they cave in and they, and they, and they cow down to who is uh, giving them the most money, if you will. So if this is allowed to happen, and is so right this panel has picked up on, the next step that they're going to, the uh, DRBC is gonna to wanna to oversee is maybe farming. Whatever they assume or they contend is a damage or a threat to the water quality in the, in the DRBC will 
uh, will be under their purview and be uh, regulated by laws that the, that the Democratic government has not put forth. And if you think that the SRBC is not looking at the same, or the, these environmentalists on the SRBC are not looking at the same thing, in Bucknell University, November 10th and 11th, uh, they have the eighth or the ninth symposium on a tale of two rivers. And I read the, um, I was given that this morning, I read the um, symposium's uh, agenda. And it's all about comparing the, the water quality in both watersheds. So that's this same thought process is, will probably, if it's allowed to, uh, if it's allowed to persist, the SRBC may also ban fracking and also become a, another quasi-governmental agency overlooking and overreaching and usurping the powers of the state of Pennsylvania's people. You'll have half your state, your environmental laws, your development laws, your, um, your um, soil water conservation laws, they will, they will be meaningless, meaningless. All I can say is thank God that you people in Pennsylvania, because I'm from New York, but that the people of Pennsylvania and your representatives are so strong and you're aware and you're pushing forward and you're making strides and you're pushing back because without you, quite frankly, nobody else gives a damn. So I leave you with those thoughts and I thank you very much for your time and your, your, your efforts and your interest in our, our, our problems. This has truly been a very uh, powerful and informative hearing so far today. We are going to turn the members for questions, Representative Pfeiffer, Representative Tallman, and then Representative Fritz. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank all the testifiers for, for coming today. And Mr. Lang, it's, it's kind of my pet peeve, too, that there, there are no moratoriums on landfills in the DRBC, but gosh forbid we could be 22 miles from the river and try to you know, extract natural gas. So. I, I don't understand that myself, so that was great testimony, and I'm going to watch it several more times, uh, and I'd like to talk to you when we're done. But, you know, Lieutenant Governor Cawley, um, former. former Lieutenant Governor Cawley, uh, spent much time traveling the Commonwealth uh, when we were looking at a way to um, draw funds from natural gas. Uh, he met with in rural Pennsylvania, knowing that there were certain um, certain uh, growth areas where we would have to um, step up as a commonwealth, and and basically through his testimony and his research and and, and through some of these um, type of town hall meetings like this, uh, with planners and, and everyone involved, we developed what what's called Act 13 or the impact fee. Uh, we don't hear about the impact fee. Uh, all we hear is about we don't have a severance tax, but we, we truly do have an impact fee, and it really has to do with uh, a dollar amount established upon the drilling instead of percentage. Uh, that dollar amount is reduced every year based upon the well sites, you know, uh, the extraction of gas. Um, and like I said, I really thought he did a great job. It was very well thought out plan. And one of the issues was, was keeping some of the money locally, um, locally to our counties, locally to our townships. And today we've heard some great testimony on, on the economic development, maybe the past, the future, uh, how this affects that. Uh, we've talked, we've listened to the, the quality of water here, what we've done. Um, you know, our watershed at the Wall and Pawpack watershed uh, has done some great job as, as far as establishing a baseline in 1980 continuing to try to improve that baseline, um, and that's 219 square miles. So, but, but included, you know, in what we were doing in the Commonwealth is, is Act 13, it became law, and, and Representative Fritz, I asked the same question to Representative Fritz um, that Representative Bloom had asked to, uh, uh, Representative Bloom had, had asked in regards to, you know, how the farmers were affected. And he said, Mike, you know, bottom line is it's amazing uh, the dollars that are going into Susquehanna County. So I have, and this is all public information, so I actually have the Susquehanna County Act 13 disbursements. So that would be an impact fee paid by these drillers to the Commonwealth, which are coming back to Susquehanna County. And in 2014, uh, over $6.1 million was returned to Susquehanna County. Now, 
Um, we have many government officials here today. We have our county people. We have a ton of township supervisors. So over $6 million uh, in 2015, it was $5.2 million. In 2016, it was 4.8 because there's less drilling. But you're looking at the county of Wayne, we're talking the $30 million budget. $6 million would be a 20% reduction in the entire county's budget for one year. Uh, and this is recurring. So this is, you know, it does fluctuate up and down, but the same amount of money also is shared by the townships. So on this printout here, you can go through Auburn Township receives 800, in 2014, $851,000. Bridgewater Township, $525,000. Brooklyn Township, $460,000. Now I look in the audience today and I have a ton of township supervisors here. Uh, our friends from Damascus Township are here. They've got over 90 miles of road. 90 miles of road, many are dirt and gravel, and we've helped them with liquid fuel dollars. We've helped them um, with dirt and gravel road programs. But I mean, an influx of money to our, to our county and to our townships would be, would be a gift. And you know, um, we're not talking about that. You know, and I just wanted to get that on, on point, that we do have an impact fee in place. Um, we are collecting this money. We are re redistributing that money back to where the drilling takes place, and Wayne County is really, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's too bad because our government officials that are here today, especially from the township level, could really use these funds to improve our way of life and quality of life. So I just wanted to point that out, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the three of you being here. And I'm kind of we'll make comments versus uh, ask a question. Uh, so Representative Mao and I have been anti-Susquehanna River Basin Commission six, seven years now. And so I have read the entire testimony when we adopted it in 1968. No, I may look like I was there then, but I wasn't. <laughs> and Mr. Shepstone, the lack of sovereignty, our state sovereignty was subjugated with the Susquehanna River Pact. And so we're, we're talking, and then Representative Fritz decided he wanted to get in on it with the, Susqu with the Delaware River Basin Commission. I'm gonna call you John. I, I agree with you, because he's always told me that no, the Delaware River Basin's way worse than the Susquehanna River Basin. So we had three hearings throughout the state on the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. They were there. So what they have done with us here, you folks out there is thumb their noses at us. That is the height of arrogance on the part of the Dus Delaware River Basin Commission. And all you folks out there, uh, us up here, uh, we're gonna be working hand in hand, but we need your support. And Representative Fritz is gonna need your support as we take on those two commissions, which I consider have taken away states' rights unbelievably. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, you and I go back a long way. Yes. So if I, uh, if I may direct a, a couple of questions towards you. I'm looking at the, the, the DRBC website right here. And at the bottom of, uh, the natural gas drilling tab page says, why is the DRBC involved? It says the commission has identified three major areas of concern and I will cite them right here from the website. Number one, gas drilling projects in the Marcellus Shale or other formations may have a substantial effect on the water resources of the basin by reducing the flow in streams and or aquifers used to supply the significant amounts of fresh water needed in the natural gas mining process. And I'll follow up with the next, two, uh, the next two areas of concern and then solicit your feedback. Number two, on-site drilling operations may potentially add discharge or cause the release of pollutants into the groundwater or surface water. And number three, the recovered frac water must be treated and disposed of properly. Those are the three areas that they find justification for their involvement. They're hanging their hat on those particular areas. And can you speak to them, please? Yes. On the... Uh 
the first one, which is the water supply issue. Uh, first of all, if you know anything about the uh, Wayne and Pike counties, you know we have a lot of water. That's one of the things with the Catskill Formation, that we have a tremendous supply of water. There's no shortage of water here. Uh, that's the first thing. And, and I would also point out that when you burn natural gas, do you know what you get? Water. Uh, as a matter of fact, every, every fracked well ultimately produces uh, far more water uh, when the gas is combusted than what is used in fracking that well. That's a fact. You can check it out. Um, the, uh, the second thing about the water quality issue, uh, or maybe that was the third thing, I forget, but the, uh, whichever it was, the, on the water quality side, I think the SRBC data speaks for itself. Uh, the, uh, and, and there was some good testimony by Jim here earlier, Jim Barber, uh, about the fact that, yes, there were some issues with methane early on, and that was an unfamiliarity with the methane migration that's common to Susquehanna County. We're way, way beyond that at this point, and there, there is still no evidence in this country of any instance of hydraulic fracturing polluting a groundwater supply. There is none, and, and the only way they get around it is by using the word fracking to include both drilling, fracking, uh, driving trucks, uh, delivering stuff. That's how they do it. Uh, they, and they say, okay, we had this methane issue uh, over in uh, Lycoming County or something, so that proves fracking pollutes the groundwater. Well, no. Uh, if you go to Lycoming County or Susquehanna County, you're going to find methane migration from drilling uh, uh, water wells. Uh, and Brian Oram, a, a well-known hydrologist who works in this area, he frequently talks about uh, when he you know, lit his first well on fire, you know, that kind of a thing, over the years. I mean, this is common stuff. Everybody around here knows this. Uh, and I could cite example after example. So there just is no validity. I forget what the third item was. The third is the recovered frack water must oh, yeah. be treated and disposed yeah, of properly. That, that's, that, Tony could speak to that probably better than I could. But the reality is that, uh, uh, fortunately, in the Northeast in particular, our companies are recycling everything. This is not an issue. Uh, you know, Cabot Oil and Gas, which I'm very close to, and, and uh, uh, they, they have been, uh, and of course they're the ones that everybody thought was the big, you know, the big problem. They turned out to be a leader at, at the end of the day. Uh, they are re recycling 100 percent of their, of their frack water. So uh, this idea that uh, somehow uh, the, the we have a big problem with this is ridiculous. And uh, so none of, their, none of their excuses hold. And the reason they're using these excuses is they're seeking power. And they're seeking power to appease a very special interest. And by special interest, and I want to get this in, a very special interest such as the William Penn Foundation, which is the Haas family, which made its money in chemicals, okay? They made their money in chemicals. And now they're spending, the, the third and fourth generation are spending their fortune that they didn't earn, <laughs> that their parents earned, and their grandparents and great-grandparents. They're spending it just like the Heinz endowments, those two. They spend the money in funding Penn Future, who you've all heard about, Clean Air Council, who you've all heard about, and the Delaware Riverkeeper, who you've all heard about. They're three attack dog organizations. And they also fund State Impact PA, by the way, but that's another story. The, those, three, those two foundations fund those organizations. They have corrupted the DRBC. And I, and I do agree with Jonathan. I'm sorry, Mr. Tallman, but Representative Tallman, but the DRBC is worse because the, because the they have corrupted the DRBC politically because they also funded the William Penn Foundation, believe it or not, uh, funded the DRBC. And they were stupid enough, stupid enough to take the money knowing they fund, also funded the Delaware Riverkeeper, which was suing him simultaneously. Now tell me that isn't corrupt. Tell me that isn't, well, all this talk about collusion lately, talk about collusion. And they had, the Delaware Riverkeeper simultaneously had uh, people on five of the seven committees of the DRBC, they had representatives on there. This is total corruption, and that's why it's happening, and that's why they're using these phony excuses. Okay. Representative Mao. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the questions that I like to ask those that say how they're protecting our groundwater resources, uh, whether it's in Susquehanna or whether it's now out here, um, how much water is below your feet? How much water is down there? How much water is under this building? The bottom line is there is no science that can tell you that. So when they say they're trying to protect it so it doesn't run out, how do they know it's going to run out? They don't. So like, like you said, Tom, that's just an excuse. Um, I do have a question. That barn, I do want to watch that. Is it B-A-R-N-S? Yes. yes, sir. 
B-A-R-N-E-S. So the owner died, okay? And then when the money ran out, they just stopped hauling that water and allow it to run into the river? Is that the way I understand it? Well, they let us haul for a while until my bill it was over $30,000. And I said, you know, are we going to get paid? And they said, no. And they said, well, you're done. So you were the contractor hired to empty the tanks right. that caught this contaminated water. And now that you're out. That was it. That the was water it. Just, just runs in. This contaminated water runs into the river. Yes, sir. Un unfiltered. Well, un who, do they get, who do they arrest today? Huh. That's a good question. Uh, I had the, the uh, head of the DEC, Region 3, Willie Janeway, down there. We walked it together because I, at that point, this letter, um, there were some other issues that we had with the DEC and with my solid, solid waste facility, so they were coming down hard on me because I was making noise. And, um, and so I beat them on those issues, and then we walked down there, and he said that they were going to do something about it. They didn't even test the water. They never tested the water. They never tested that leachate from a Superfund site. And then they still don't know what the contaminants are coming out of that today. So with you, all the millions of dollars DRBC has collected from its property owners, municipal authorities and such, they haven't spent any money to take care of that? Spend. Not one dollar. Thank you. And Thank let me you, mention, Will, I know Willie Janeway, as he knows him, and he's, he's, a, he's a, I don't think he's with the EC anymore, but he's no. a true believer environmentalist, a true believer, okay? And you all know what I mean. But when it comes right down to it, he couldn't do anything, and he wasn't willing to do anything. Exactly right. Thank you. Well, thank you to this panel. Seeing other questions on behalf of the House of Representatives Policy Committee, I'm honored to be here. I'm thankful for your testimony. And to you, the, the um, constituents listening to this, you've got some brave people who are willing to come forth and share this information. It's how we learn and gather better information. Uh, this production will be available um, relatively soon. I think we might even be streaming live. And for our members that are not here, uh, they will be able to listen and participate in follow-up hearings on this issue. Uh, Representative Fritz, I want to thank you. And to your constituents, you know, when Sandy announced she was going to retire, we all went, oh, gosh, we can't lose Sandy. And you're always <laughs> concerned, you know, you're going to get a rookie come in here and who's going to replace them. And I have to say, we've been very blessed with John's presence. He's uh, obviously not very shy, but he's also very knowledgeable. I'm impressed with the homework that he's done, not only on this subject, but other issues in the legislature. So. With that note, John, thank you very much for having us here. To my colleagues, thank you for taking time and staying here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for those kind words. And, uh, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to do right by my maker and my family and my constituents. So uh, I hope that my actions are simply an extension of that. Uh, I'm going to offer up some closing commentary, if I may. In my hand, I hold a newspaper. It's the Scranton Times Tribune, dated Thursday, September 21, where they cover Governor Wolf making some, some, uh, some publicity visits, visiting Tunkhannock. And I'm going to quote the newspaper here. The governor said the community has done a great job reinventing itself, and you all should be justly proud. He cited the Route 6 bypass completed 20 years ago, new sidewalks from 10 years ago, a vibrant community theater, and right here, folks, right here is the, the main part, and the influx of cash from Marcellus Gas. Unbelievable. It speaks to, friends, a very obvious double standard. Natural gas development is illustrated as being done safely in the Susquehanna River Basin, but it's gauged as too risky for the Delaware River Basin. Susquehanna River Basin landowners are able to realize the economic opportunity, the growth, family-sustaining jobs, ancillary business stimulation, royalty payments, sizable impact fee payments, and tax relief. Folks, tax relief that comes with the natural gas industry. DRBC landowner, landowners, rather, are being treated as second-class citizens and being wrongly deprived of their property rights in that same opportunity. Now, friends, I prescribe, and I'm probably not the only one up here that prescribes to the Siri, that when warranted, government's role is to guide, steer, or perhaps restrict a given activity. But absent the soundest justification for doing so, 
permanently banning such an activity can have profound, precedential, programmatic, and legal consequences. It is very well illustrated and very well known and very well documented that current method natural gas drilling has been occurring for over 10 years, over 10 years in Pennsylvania, with close to 10,000 wells elsewhere in the Commonwealth. It begs the question, how can it be done safely in other basins, but at the same time be considered as too risky for the Delaware River Basin? And again, that resonates that there is a very clear double standard. Friends, this is very much a property rights issue. Wayne County and Pike County residents are being deprived of their rights, along with economic opportunity and liberty. And I take very, very serious issue with that. And I'm so pleased to have all of you here today that share in that same frustration and disdain, and as well my colleagues seated up here with me. We are pushing back. Thank you for being part of that effort. Thank you for being part of that initiative. God bless each and every one of you.